Learning Among Jewish Social Groups in, a in Ptolemaic Egypt. This paper, to some extent, is me bringing together various notes on the language and learning situation in Hellenistic Egypt. And I'm intentionally trying not to talk merely about literacy, although that will be an important background to it. Um, and so I'll, I'll partly speak freely, partly read a few paragraphs where I managed to get them written in time. Um, perhaps when you were preparing to come here, Jonathan sent you an email looking something similar to this letter. Oops. No. Hey, that's it, yes. It is the right letter, isn't it? Yes. Um, he may be sent a letter like this. This letter is now preserved among the Xenon papyri from the third century BC and introduces the bearer, the one carrying the letter, Hokomidzon, as one Menestheos. And this has attracted some attention amongst New Testament studies because he's a letter carrier. This Menestheos is offering to give a lecture in Philadelphia on Homer, and it's passage one on the handout. Uh, he's bringing to you this letter to missing part to do something peritu poietu about the poet, meaning Homer. Uh, and it asks Sinon to gather an audience of students, as many as he can muster, pleistu sunegegis. In this small testimony, we're reminded of two things, apart from the letter carrier, which has been the focus. The first is that in Egypt of the early Ptolemaic period, access to books and education in Greek could be found in many centers outside Alexandria. Indeed, where there was sufficient gathering of Greeks. And indeed, the Xenon papyri come from Philadelphia in the Fayum, and the Fayum was a major settlement of Greeks under Ptolemy II uh, for the, once he'd developed it for agricultural purposes. Second, we're reminded that such traveling teachers would have no doubt carried books or lecture notes with him. This Menetheos is bringing this letter, but he's also bringing books. Um, such uh, portable boxes of scrolls, capsi, capsi, are frequently represented in Roman art, as we see here as one of many examples. They're natural places for storage, even for cataloging of books, but it also allowed their portability. We may presume Menesios has his own copy of Homer and his notes on which he is going to lecture. The movement of books and the access to literature and opportunities for education implied in this one little papyrus all contribute to the picture we may gain of the ancient world. The placement of Jews within the wider educational system of antiquity is still a topic requiring further evaluation, all the more so as Greco-Roman education is still an arena of change in scholarly debate and of debate itself. The landmark work of Harris, Ancient Literacy, probably known to everyone here, raises questions regarding the extent of literacy. His comparisons with the history of Western Europe required him to identify three factors necessary for mass literacy. Extensive networks of schools, firstly. Secondly, technology allowing for affordable access to texts, so mass printing in the modern world. And thirdly, an urban demography, so a large urban location in which this uh, propagation of books could take place. Such direct comparisons with Western Europe, however, can be problematic and have un understandably been questioned, not least by Van Minnen, whose work I will return to, who, who says comparisons with, say, the medieval world are inappropriate for ancient Egypt. The medieval world where the scholastic monasteries in the center of cities controlled literacy. While literacy is not the sum of education, it's an important starting point for our study of education. And Harris estimates literacy at a mere 10 to 15 percent of the Roman world. The importance of Harris's study is that it was influential for Hedger's, Catherine Hedger's study of Jewish literacy. 
still the major study, study of the subject for Jews. Following earlier work on Meir Bailan, Heja places literacy in Roman Palestine at potentially a much lower level than even for the Greco-Roman world at large. So much lower than 10%, perhaps 3 to 5%. A corrective to Hezer's position, however, has recently been offered by Michael Wise, who uses documentary evidence to illustrate the extent of literacy in a multilingual context. That's um, the, the bibliography is on the second or third page of the handout. Um, Wise demonstrates that there were those able to write in significant numbers not only in Aramaic, but also in Hebrew and Greek, particularly in the Bar Kokhba archives. The debates among historians of Greco-Roman world, as much as among historians of Jews in Judea, are indicative of the problems of interpreting the evidence for literacy. Our evidence is itself fragmentary and highly dependent on climactic conditions, rendering Egyptian evidence, where the conditions are wonderful for preserving papyri, but not in Alexandria itself, and the Judean ever desert as important exceptions to the lost material evidence. Therefore, Hellenistic Judaism is actually very important because it's the one place where we have substantial evidence of literacy. But it also then does not allow abstraction for other areas unless we're allowed historical reconstruction. Literary authors may provide us with statements on education but these can often be focused on their areas of interest, especially the tertiary stage of education, more than the earlier stages. And one of the criticisms of Harris is that he relies on the literary evidence of tertiary education. And indeed, Hezer relies on the evidence of rabbinic literature, which as we have seen, has an ideology of orality and is, is not interested in books. Finally, levels of literacy and education will vary considerably, and the expectations of antiquity do not necessarily match our own levels of acceptability. Literary and literacy and education were pragmatic goals that largely depended on their functionality. We judge literacy by ability to function in modern society. In antiquity, literacy was the ability to do whatever you needed to do with your writing or reading, which are separate activities, of course. Individuals would attain the levels that they required for daily life or for their employability without needing or expecting to go further or beyond that. So much for generalization. If we consider Hellenistic Jews within this picture, we encounter certain problems. First, for the Ptolemaic period, and note I'm focusing on that period, so from the founding or conquering of Egypt by Alexander the Great through to the first century BCE up to the Roman conquest. For at least the third and second centuries, we have little evidence of Jewish literary activity and education beyond certain clues. So for almost two centuries of Jews in Ptolemaic Egypt, until maybe we could say after about 130 or 120 BCE, we start to have evidence. We do nonetheless have within this the Septuagint, an area that has been the focus of my research in recent years, and so easy for me to use, and which can be considered in this wider context. Second, there is much we can learn from documentary sources in archaeology about the setting in, which Egypt, in, setting in Egypt in which Jews found themselves. Even if we don't have much about Jews, we know a lot about Egypt in which they lived. Although literature can present a perspective on the reality of the educational system, literature can only be a partial perspective and should be supplemented by other data that is also itself partial. Third, there can be a tendency to see the surviving literature that we do have especially from late Ptolemaic and Roman periods, as typical or representative of educated Hellenistic Jews. Philo stands as the most sophisticated example. And obviously, there are some people <laughs> on this room who have a particular interest in Philo. But we always have to ask how representative or typical he is. He may well be totally atypical. 
But, and we can also point to other well-educated authors, such as Aristias, Three Maccabees, Ezekiel the Tragedian, who all display knowledge of Greek literature, a high level and register of Greek language, and a knowledge of Greek literary forms. They all clearly reflect a tradition of Greek education among Jews of Egypt, commensurate with much amongst Greeks and others in Hellenistic times. The question is, how far should we read all our evidence through such a prism? Or can we seek for different social groups reflecting different types of education among Jews? Fourth and finally, if we locate the majority of Jewish Greek literary activity within Alexandria, an assumption but no more, but still a very strong assumption amongst historians of Hellenistic Judaism, um, again, we can exclude Philo because he does say he's from Alexandria. Um, if we do not follow that assumption, we avoid presenting a uniform cultural world, a world from which the Jewish writers all sprang from this one Alexandrian location um, and their distinctive educational setting within the shadow of the Alexandrian library. I will not say more directly on that, other than to point out the, the wide myth of the Alexandrian Library and how much ideology is built around it, which may not reflect reality in classical writers. Let me begin then with degrees of literacy. Literacy in antiquity can be seen to be a complex phenomenon and has regularly been illustrated by the case of the poor, hapless Pateus, the village scribe about whom more has, ever, has been written than any other. It's amazing how many articles there are about it. P. Pateus, so from the archive of Pateus 121 on the overhead projector, is, large, is the largest seat, sheet on which the village scribe called Pateus practiced his writing. From other documents, we know Pateus was appointed the village scribe, the title Como Grammatus, scribe of the village, of Ptolemaeus Hermu and nearby villages for a three-year period beginning in 183 to 184 CE. So this is Roman period. His signature as a village scribe guaranteed the document had been authorized before being sent out. So his main job was to authorize documents. And therefore, he practiced on this piece of paper the essential lines that he had to write to authorize the document. The line he was meant to write is, I, Pateus, village scribe, submitted this understood, which in Greek would be Pateus, coma grammatus, abbreviated, abbreviated as coma gra, and epidoka. So just three words, his name, coma gra, and Epidedoka, uh, I submitted, or simply Pateus Epidedoka. As you can see on the left, he, he, he practiced it with a number of lines and then on the, turned it over and continued on the other side before giving up. If we look more closely, what we actually see is that uh, the beginning of his name was written twice, so he had difficulty with his name in line one and line nine. Uh, you maybe not see it very clearly. Uh, you can see line nine is the penultimate line where he's tried to write Pateus twice. In line three, he missed the third letter of the verb and squeezed in the iota afterwards. So instead of writing epi dedoka, he wrote ep dedoka and had to add the iota having got it right the first two lines. Then in line four, instead of writing epi, he wrote eti. So he wrote a tau instead of a pi. In line five, he missed the epsilon augment prefix on the first letter of the verb, and so on, including at the end, he puts a big thumbprint. It's just a, sorry, this slide cuts it off a little bit. Um, there's a big thumbprint in the margin. I wonder if we can go go back to the previous one, whether that's clearer. Yeah, there, you see, it's a big, so either he had inky fingers like a poor student, or he was just trying to sign it off using, um, using his thumb. Uh, 
Um, now, it's clear the content here is not normal for school exercise, so it's not an exercise for school, and the archive shows he wasn't a school child, so it's actually someone who was trying to learn how to sign off the document. What's significant here is that he was the village scribe. He was the person, was, in our terms, responsible for writing and authorising documents, but he certainly would have had great difficulty writing any such documents. And his status is actually determined by his wealth and his importance. Someone less important and less wealthy would have done the writing. Um, it's not his literacy that establishes him, establishes him as a scribe, nor does his literary establish his importance for written documents. All that comes from his social status, and the writing is a separate issue. And this problematizes, to some extent, what we mean by education and literacy. Turning to Jews in Hellenistic Egypt, there are many elements which enable us to reconstruct something of the Jews in Ptolemaic Egypt. Importantly, discoveries from the 19th century papyri and inscriptions tell us much about the Jews, as well as about language use in Egypt. Evidence for the presence of Jews in Egypt is comparatively extensive, and we often forget this, in many regions from early on in the Hellenistic period. Indeed, from the Persian period, there is, of course, Elephantini, already mentioned. Uh, by the third century, there's a well-known or well-documented community in Memphis, the capital. In the Fayum, many villages, um, put up a map for your sake, many villages contain Jews or peoples with Semitic names. And through the presence of inscriptions across the length of Egypt and papyri across the length of Egypt, we can see that Jews were well spread out. Most important of all is a recently published, fully published, although known before, archive of the salt tax papyri, which I've been in a number of publications emphasize their significance for Jewish studies. The salt tax papyri, and here's the key one, P count um, 26, the salt tax papyri uh, are a record of those people registered for tax relief because they are classed as Hellenes. Um, among the papyri, the village of Trichomia in the Fayum is particularly informative since we find there, and we're talking about the uh, mid to late third century BCE, so very early on in the Ptolemaic period, um, we find in Trichomia a population that seems to have been largely Jewish in the village of Maron. That is to say, in the register list of 132 people, 89 of them are Jewish names or names favored by Jews. We can't always be certain that they're Jewish, but certainly they're Semitic. They all are classed as Hellenes, that is tax Hellenes, and so belong to a privileged group that formed a separate category from other Greeks, at least for fiscal purposes. Their status was high, receiving tax exemption, probably because they participated in the gymnasium or were involved in the army or administration. This does not prove they had a high level of Greek education but it means they had to function in Greek circles and Greek society, and in some cases would, by going through the gymnasium, have had a level of Greek literacy. This sort of evidence is extremely important since it testifies to the fact that in no time at all, Jews in Egypt were learning Greek and being seen as Greek. This is contrary to what some historians of Judaism have said. The papyri, the, papyri fill, fill, the, excuse me, the papyri revealed to us a group that would have been at least at home in Greek, probably using it both for teaching and working and living in Egypt. And among these, last time I spoke about them, um, Joan asked me, are any of them women? There are actually many women because it includes household heads, and many women were household heads. And we know generally in Egypt, women did learn Greek, and did learn to teach and write. So it's quite possible Jewish women 
we're doing the same here. How did this come about? Well, one scholar on the handout, Crespo, has talked about the language policy of the Ptolemies. I don't think we can talk about a specific language policy, but we can talk about movements in the language situation in Greek. Uh, clearly, tax relief was one way to encourage Greek education. Another way is through employment. You could be employed if you knew Greek. And what we see early in Ptolemaic Egypt is that there were not many Greeks to administer the country, and therefore they had to employ Egyptians. But they needed Egyptians to write Greek documents for them. So there's clear evidence that Egyptians quickly learned the task of writing Greek. Official documents are usually in Greek. And when bilingual, the demotic language often seems to be second, secondary to the Greek, but not always. Um, and indeed, over time, Ptolemies uh, started to require Greek, such as in the revenue laws of Ptolemy II, he stated the law had to be proclaimed in both languages. So that we can see the educational benefits uh, of allowing access to employment and education if people learnt Greek. Let me move on to the Septuagint. Um, I've now lost my own handout. There we are. Um, if we begin to think about the Septuagint as an important document of the position of Jews in Hellenistic society, I'd like to suggest that the Septuagint, in a way, is quite separate from Philo, Aristias, and similar writers. Um, interestingly, in the early, in the 19th century, people were somewhat more happy to see Septuagint translators as some sort of middle-class Jews, perhaps lower-level education than others. So Zacharias Frenkel um, supposed the translators had come from among Jews living in the Chora of Egypt. And Grinfield, in his apology to the Septuagint, argued they were descended from Egyptian Jews in Alexandria, but who had mingled with the Macedonian armies and whose descendants now formed a part of the commercial population. These were suggestions of the 19th century, which seemed to have been lost in the 20th century, where gradually the translators became the scholars around the Alexandrian library. And even if not really a scholar in Alexandrian library, they were somehow scholars in the shadow of the library. Um, whereas I'd like to turn back to the idea that we perhaps, by looking at these translators, we're looking at the middle class uh, people working amongst the documents. Um, one piece of evidence is merely the linguistic. Simple, I put two simple examples on page five, on note five of the handout. One is the fact that they come to use the everyday word for donkey, hupuzugion, as opposed to onos. This has been written about. Or if they're looking for a word for storehouse, rather than going for the good classical word thesaurus, they use the word apodocheon. Uh, which is a um, word found in the papyri. It's rather like the loan words. It's the, it's the word people were using at the time. Equally, I could point to grammatical evidence, um, which is number 15 on the handout. I don't have 15 examples on the handout, but it's page two, number 15. I just give the example from Genesis 19.9, which is a very common, uh, common phrase in Genesis, nun un, as a form of uh, conclusion, now therefore, which is translation of Greek, of Hebrew va'ata. Um, and what's interesting, we see nun un as almost a documentary term. Um, you see it, for example, in two papyri there, which. It's very common in the documentary material. It's almost unattested in literary material. And we can contrast this to the alternative rendering, nun ga, which only appears once in Genesis, but which is very common in literature and only once in documentary. So the Septuagint Pentateuch 
favors, I think, 19 times the, the common documentary example and does not favor the common literary example. So they're writing a Greek on par with documentary writers. Therefore, I think we could say they are part of these documentary uh, uh, scribes to be found across Egypt, or, and indeed, perhaps those who are classed as Hellenes. This brings me rapidly, still have a few minutes, actually, brings me to the question of what sort of education did they have, and how did they have it? Um, I probably cannot prove it in the same way uh, as been so well done by looking at uh, scripts in Aramaic. Um, but I'd like to think a little bit more about the movement and access to books. And particularly, if these were people gaining their employment in villages or in communities, where did they get access to the books? Firstly, we should bear in mind books can travel. The preface to Ben Sira, um, the Greek translation, number six on the handout, uh, is a well-known passage where he speaks, when I came to Egypt, and note the translator never says he went to Alexandria, he only went to Egypt, but it's almost universally assumed he meant Alexandria. But it's not proven at all. When I came to Egypt in the 38th year of Euergetes and stayed there for some time, what did he, did he do? Well, he found something. But we're not sure what he found because the Greek is ambiguous. He either found a lack of learning or he found a book. Um, it's not clear. Uh, anyway, what he did seem to say is he found that people didn't know his grandfather Ben Sira's book. And therefore, he arranged for it to be translated by himself. So either he's bringing his grandfather's book, or there is access to his grandfather's book in Hebrew in Egypt. Probably he's bringing it with him, because it's a Hebrew book, and decided to translate it. So the book is moving. And we have many other examples. Firstly, if we look at the Egyptian papyri, we see Jews coming and going from all sorts of different locations. People have titles which say they came to here or they went to there. Um, so the, the Jews seem to be a highly mobile population in antiquity. Um, we also have other examples of moving books. We have the teacher on Homer, who's probably bringing along his box of lecture notes and Homeric texts. We have the famous tale in Galen of ships arriving in the harbor and being searched for their scrolls so they can be taken for the Alexandrian Library, which is part of the myth of the Alexandrian Library. But if nothing else, it's an important tale because it reminds us books would travel and come with people. We also have the possibility of libraries at Leontopolis if some books were written there. We have the evidence of the Cairo Geniza, which is a later period. But the important thing about the Cairo Geniza is that it preserved Second Temple texts, Ben Sira, Damascus document, Aramaic, Levi, at a minimum. Uh, there are some other possibilities, which are documents which actually, before they were in Cairo, ended up in Babylon or in Palestine. Um, and this shows that at some point, Second Temple texts moved to other parts of the Jewish world. Um, we also have Qumran, and whatever we make of Qumran, uh, it's almost certain that some of the texts did not originate there. It is certain in biblical texts, case of biblical texts. Uh, but Qumran is a sign of perhaps a wider circulation of books. Finally, let us think about who had access to these books. And again, moving away from the image of a major library. Both Clarissa and Van Minen have shown the relationship between preserved literary finds and documentary archives. So work done by your village scribe versus literary finds. As Van Minen has emphasized, we should not project backwards experiences from medieval Europe, where books were expensive and people in villages were largely illiterate. Uh, 
Instead, books are to be found in villages throughout Egypt. These can in part be accounted for by the large presence of Greeks and the availability of literature in schools and gymnasia. But this doesn't account for the whole picture. The presence of Egyptian temples in many locales seems to account for some distribution of Greek literature. And as well as Egyptian temples, we also, of course, have the prosuchai, the Jewish prayer houses, recorded in inscriptions in many locations, which may well have also been an attractive um, magnetism for books. In these Egyptian temples, there seem to be both Demotic and Greek papyri in the same locations. These were priestly families with their own private collections, not actually temples themselves. Van, Van Minen focuses only on the Fayum and covers a broad temporal framework with a particular concentration in the Roman period, which is partly our chance of survival. Ev evidence nonetheless from the third century BCE confirms the availability of Greek literature. So doing my own survey, in the Fayum, we find literature in such places as Ankyropolis, Goran, Gurob, Karanas, Magdala, and Philadelphia. And in the, these small villages, the collections include poetry, both archaic and Hellenistic, tragedy, Homer, philosophy, Aristotle, scientific texts, and school exercises. Thus, should you wish, you could pick up a copy of Aeschylus or Anaximenes in Ankyropolis, Aristotle in Gurob, Callimachus in Charinus. Xenon, who was well educated and wrote his letters in standard Koine Greek, his letters being documentary letters, um, had in his collection a copy of Euripides' Hippolytus and some poetry, probably of the archaic poet Archilochus. He also famously commissioned two, dog, two poems on his dog, Taurus, who died saving him from a wild boar. These texts suggest some were held in personal collections, as those copied by Zenon for the gymnasium, which I haven't mentioned it. Uh, and these might be used in school as well, if that schooling was at home, while others would have been stored at school houses or gymnasia. I'll come back to the gymnasium. We should be careful not to distinguish between the high elites who are composing literature, which is what they did in the museum, and your ordinary administrator writing letters. Both would have had access to literature. Indeed, all that we know of the educational system in antiquity indicates learning to read or write involved memorizing portions of literature. As a result, we can see the effect of literary studies on the authors of even everyday documents. It's, um, I wonder if I've got, ah, uh, that's a different topic. Let's uh, ignore that for a moment. Um, it, it's possible the one who composed Zenon's dog poems, his local scribe, he got him to write the poems, also wrote documentary letters, uh, since in one short letter, he twice breaks out into iambic verse. Elsewhere, one finds Homeric poems used occasionally homeric words in documentary letters. So people writing letters are using literary forms. Most striking of all is the example from Charinus, but unfortunately in a later period from the one we're considering, so the Roman period. In a tax receipt, the author uses a great, rare Greek word for mouse catcher, otherwise only found in Callimachus's Aitia. He probably read about the origins of the mouse trap in the Aitia, and then used it to translate the everyday Egyptian word for mouse catcher. It's like someone using a Shakespearean term to translate something today. Therefore, this means that documentary scribe not only could read Callimachus, uh, but he could also read Egyptian and translate the Egyptian document into Greek. And indeed, a copy of Callimachus is found in the same archive. It would be lovely to think that this is the copy of Callimachus he read uh, when before writing the letters. And we could say moments of literary flourish in the Septuagint itself can be attributed to a similar rationale, where these are documentary scribes who have learned literature as part of learning to read and write, and then use it occasionally. <clears throat> 
to give some more examples around the same time as the first letter that we began with, namely the letter of the letter carrier. Another letter here is also preserved in the Xenon archive. And this is example four, three, no, two. <laughs> two, <laughs> example two on the handout. Um, this is a request. He begins, um, he begins about telling him about some local issues around housing. And he requests Demias, who is head of the local gymnasium in Philadelphia, asking Xenon for some books. Therefore, it says, you would do well to write to us how things stand on these matters regarding their mortgage on the house. And as for the scrolls, if you've already copied them, send so we might spend some leisure time because there was no one with whom we could talk. It's rather dismissive of your neighbors. But uh, what we see here, we have a passing mention of Apollonius's personal library. Xenon was working for Apollonius. Uh, and this, this library serves as a source for those wishing copies, perhaps similar to print on demand today. There is no evidence of any other lending, but it is implied. Note the intention, too, to have leisure time and a lack of conversation partners. So it's a sign that literature was used in some form of leisure activity. Another interesting example of a book loan is in Demotic, this one. A Demotic letter from Tebdubdis, dated to the second or first century BCE. It mentions the loan of two books. The letter is written in an apologetic tone, apparently because the return of the books is overdue. Um, just to read some of it out, I, I never cease to ask anyone whom I can find about your well-being, and they tell me no harm has befallen the prophet of filth until today. I have caused Horus, son of Maris, my brother, to bring you the medical book and the jar book, a total of two books, which you gave to me before this day. Don't cause a rebuke because of the delay which has happened. I would not have found anyone trustworthy. And then the letter breaks off at the bottom. Looking at Qumran, Popovich and two recent publications has argued for similar situations in Judea on the analogy of the Greco-Roman evidence. He argues for a differentiated use of literary texts by people in Jewish society. He sees most Judean finds as coming from the private collections of wealthy individuals, not only restricted to urban elite, but spread throughout the strata of society. And this seems to be the situation in Egypt as well. Whilst these are wealthy individuals, in many cases, they are responding to different elements of society, and there is access to books for um, ordinary people. For Popovitz, the Egyptian evidence also points to, to the diffusion of literary texts in villages outside the urban centers, which I agree. Oddly, he argues writing skills were insignificant for a person's social status, um, which is true of Pataeus, at least but that the possession of texts among elite would have been highly valued, used to show off, he suggests, as rather like coffee table books. Um, for him, scholarly texts were of a different nature from everyday texts. And this is where I think he makes an unnecessary distinction between Qumran texts and other Judean finds. The Qumran texts are scholarly texts, as opposed to Judean finds are uh, books owned by wealthy individuals. I think you cannot do that on the codological evidence. I seem to have far too many notes here on different things. I'm not even sure what they are. Um, let me therefore try to conclude this brief tour. What we see is the spread of the use of Greek in a particular interesting area to proceed further would be relationships between Greek and the Demotic Egyptian language and the use between the two. But we see a widespread of the use of Greek in different strata of society. 
and I believe access to books in many different locations and books being used by people we would not normally consider scholars, namely village scribes. And therefore, I think we, we can identify that literacy is more than mere reading and writing. Literacy can allow you access to literature. And that Jews in antiquity would have had as much access as others, given their location in Egypt and given the widespread of access in Egypt. We do need to distinguish, nonetheless, between different levels of Jews in society. And in particular, I think the Septuagint gives an insight to Jews who were more of this middle class scribal group, not the philosophically educated group that we would find in Alexandria. And therefore, the Septuagint is actually an important uh, step in our understanding Jews of different social statuses in antiquity. Thank you.